After two topsy-turvy seasons to begin his tenure as head coach, Hubert Davis just completed his best and most complete season to date. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, July 31st, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels Podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining me at The Place to get your Tar Heels content every single day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. And I want to send a special shout out to all you everydayers and all the members of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord. Super glad that you've all chosen to be here. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Oh, coming up on the show today, we have come to the final day of our countdown of the top 10 most impactful things to happen in Carolina athletics over the 2023-24 athletics season. This is the second annual. I did this last summer and it was super fun. And I love doing it right now because as we turn the calendar tomorrow to August, it's going to be time. Like that is the month that we will have a football game and other Carolina sports kicking up. And so it's a perfect day to be wrapping this up and launching into the next athletics season. So we began this on Monday, this top 10 countdown with numbers 10 through seven. Today we go, or yesterday, excuse me, we went six through four and today we'll finish with three through one. Let me just recap it all for you in case you missed out on those shows. Although honestly, you should stop and go back and watch or listen to them uh, to get that whole top 10 um, and to be able to go through all of that. Number 10, we talked about Carolina sweeping Duke last year in basketball. Number nine, we talked about kind of the deja vu nature of the football season. Hot start, cold, ice cold ending. Number eight, Parker Wolf's national championship in individual national championship in the 5K. Number seven, we talked about uh, Aranza's back to back two time national championships in one meter and three meter diving. Number six, we talked about R.J. Davis's magical season last year. Number five, we got to Vance Honeycutt's career and how great it was for the Diamond Heels. And we wrapped up yesterday's show, number four, talking about Drake May and everything he did for North Carolina. So coming up on uh, three through one today, if yesterday was individual success, today is all team success. And we're going to get to some honorable mentions at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that as well. Kicking everything off. And by the way, I, I keep I forgot to say today, I want to hear the things that you would have on your list. Would you do some of the same as me? Would you have different things? Or do you agree, disagree? I, I love having those interactions. Hop into the Discord and let's talk about it. Would be a lot of fun. All right, number three on our list. This was the best season of the Hubert Davis era. And in so doing, they won the ACC outright regular season title and earned a one seed. Love it. Great, great, great stuff. And and let's set some context with this. It was a topsy-turvy first two seasons for the Tar Heels under Coach Davis. 21-22, we remember. A so-so regular season for the most part till about the latter third. Heels put it together down the stretch. They beat Duke at Duke to wrap up Coach K's regular season career. And that whole media circus that ESPN had going on made it all the sweeter. Was so happy about that. Carolina races through the ACC tournament, beating the breaks off Marquette, that wild game against defending national champion Baylor, beating a very good UCLA team, oh, by the way, St. Peter's in the Elite Eight, uh, who was on that magical run, and then we all know where things went from there, beating Duke again to end Coach K's career in the first ever time these two teams had ever met in the NCAA tournament, and it just so happened to be in the Final Four. It was sweet. And that's where that season ended. I don't I don't think it went on to a national champion. No, in all seriousness, I still contend that Carolina is a bum Armando Baycott ankle away from that national championship. Hurts. Uh, so that year was kind of, yeah, 2022-23. Carolina's preseason number one. Things never came together. Heels missed the NCAA tournament. Lots of guys transfer out. And that sets the stage for this past season. Where Carolina... Brought in a bunch of guys. The they had skipped the the NIT. The coaching staff 
kind of had a better idea of what they wanted and went out and got it. Consequently, they finished the season 29 and 8 overall, 14 and 1 at home, 17 and 3 in conference play. Also, Carolina was 8 and 2 in true road games. So impressive to me. The kind of worst record was neutral court where they were 7 and 5. Obviously, two of those are are ACC tournament and NCAA tournament, and then three non-con losses. So in all, Carolina, again, 17 and three in the ACC. They are the first ever team to win 17 ACC games in the 20-game ACC era. Just the second team ever to win 17 ACC games. Virginia did it, uh, that went 17 and one in the 27, 18 season, but that was when there was 18 games. So more impressive, but still just two teams have ever done it. Uh, Carolina came so close to not just winning the ACC regular season, but the ACC tournament just ran into that really hot NC state team that just suddenly figured themselves out, not just in the ACC tournament, but in the NCAA tournament as well. You might remember, let's remember back. Boat raced Florida State in the first game of the ACC tournament in the quarterfinals, uh, had to come back from a deficit against Pitt, and then just couldn't ever come back from the deficit against NC State. Everyone was pushing a little bit, and then the the, the pieces just never came together in that one, unfortunately. I don't know about for you, but the first real sign for me of like, oh, this team could be legit was that first half drubbing of Tennessee in the inaugural ACC-SEC challenge with Dalton Connect and, and everybody else. Tennessee had Jonas Adu, Santiago Vescovi, um, Zakai Ziegler coming off an of injury. And, and Carolina just went to work in the first half. I know Tennessee made a push in the second half, but still. That was when I – because I believed a great deal in what Tennessee was bringing to the table. And so I saw that and I was like, oh – we might have some, because to that point, all you would had was a couple, three by games at home to start the year. And then the battle for Atlantis games, which beat Northern Iowa, lost to Villanova in overtime, who ended up being awful last year. They were not good. And then beat Arkansas in the last game, who was all also ended up being not good. So we really didn't learn anything from those first six games. And then that Tennessee game came and it was like, oh, Okay, we got something here. But then you lose to UConn and you lose to Kentucky. And it's like, well, you know, maybe not. <clears throat> but then those those were the only three non-conference losses, Villanova, UConn, and Kentucky. Because Carolina all season, as I had said, eight total losses, the average margin of defeat was 4.88 points. So they were essentially in almost every game. Only lost by double digits once. That was to def- the national champion, UConn by 11. Like that was one of the best games against UConn this whole year. And I love that in this season, you very clearly had three number one seeds, UConn, Purdue, and Houston. And outside of that, there was a whole bunch of teams vying for that fourth spot. And it's the Tar Heels that I don't think, I I think after the season before, everybody was just writing us off. Everybody saying, no, Carolina can't do it. But this team put the pieces together figured out what they had a great, you know, was every coaching decision all season long. Perfect. By no means, but they figured out for the most part, how to put the pieces together with the personnel that they had and with a freshman point guard and make this thing work and got a number one seed. This is just great. And unfortunately you had that uncharacteristically cold game from RJ Davis from deep in the sweet 16 to prevent them from going to the elite eight. I mean, there are obviously some other things and we don't need to relitigate that. Um, but it was the only game all season where RJ didn't make a three and a game that Carolina could have won and gone on, but they didn't. And that's okay because it was still a great and complete season, right? Like if we're measuring a season by you didn't make it past the sweet 16. So it was a failure. I, I can't do that. Right? Like at that point, there's so much that has to go right to get to the, even just get to the second weekend and then beyond. So really, really good from Carolina. You might remember Oklahoma had a stellar undefeated run to begin the season. Carolina beat them in the jump man invitational. It was the Sooners first loss. They ended up not being as great, you know, had a rough big 12 run, but still at that point it was like, dude, this Oklahoma team's really good. That was part of a stretch where Carolina 
for the first time ever, played five ranked teams in a stretch of six games, five ranked teams in the AP poll. It's the first time they had ever done that since the AP poll started. And they went four and two in that stretch, beating Arkansas, Tennessee, Florida State, and Oklahoma. Really impressive stuff. And then, you know, some other stuff. Like, I'll just mention one other thing that happened in the season that was really impressive to me. Carolina, you know, they had the Florida State game. You play that one ACC game. But then in the main chunk of ACC games, Carolina had to start with three straight road games. And at the time, you looked at the teams and you're like, yeah, okay, you know, they, they're they solid teams. But I think looking back on it, that three-game winning streak was very impressive. Carolina went and won at Pitt, 70-57. to Pitt, a team that, frankly, got hosed getting left out of the NCAA tournament. Bub Carrington was an absolute dude, right? We saw that in the ACC semifinal. Carolina went and beat them by 13. Then Carolina went and won at Clemson by 10, 65 to 55. Obviously, Clemson came back and beat Carolina at the Smith Center for the second time ever. Um, but, I mean, we saw what – Clemson was a really good team. You saw how well they did in the NCAA tournament. And then Carolina went and won at NC State by 13, a team that ended up doing what they did in the postseason. So that three-game stretch to me – was insanely impressive. A great and, again, complete season by the Tar Heels. The best one in Hubert Davis's young head coaching career. Cannot wait to see what this next season holds for the Tar Heels. Well, Hubert Davis's Tar Heels made the Sweet 16, but Scott Forbes' Diamond Heels, they went even further. And we'll talk about that next. Right after I tell you about game time, going to MLB games in the summer is one of my favorite all-time pastimes. The game, the food, the people, everything that's part of the experience. And I'm always excited to make those new memories every summer, just like this summer. And thankfully, when you're buying last-minute tickets, you don't have to sweat high prices because game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting your tickets faster and easier. In fact, Prices on the game time app, they go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Tomorrow, again, we turn the calendar to August, and that means it's the month that Carolina plays football. Maybe you want to hit the road and go to the opening game at Minnesota. How cool would that be? Tickets are already on game time. The cheapest one, $37 each, it's in the upper corner. Here's what I would go with, though. The best deal, lower sideline, section 144, row 35, 73 bucks each. Get in there, wear some blue, live it up. See if you can go find Dawson Garcia somewhere in the stadium. It'd be a lot of fun. Well, here's the thing. Go to game time, take the guesswork out of buying tickets. You can download their app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Again, Create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Thanks again for joining us on Locked On Tar Heels today, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. From the uh, basketball Tar Heels, the men's basketball Tar Heels to the Diamond Heels, a number two on our countdown. The Diamond Heels go on this magical run, a great entire season that lands them in the 2024 College World Series and the first of Scott Forbes' head coaching career. Wow, I hadn't even thought about this. Everyone, all these teams we're talking about today, it's all coaches in the first three years of their coaching, head coaching career. Really, really cool. Uh, I guess with Scott Forbes, this was number four. All head coaches in the first four years of their head coaching career. And so I just... Anytime you're replacing and uh, just somebody who's been the man like Hubert Davis, replacing Roy Williams, like Scott Forbes, replacing coach Fox, it, it's very difficult to find your own DNA, to find your own way. And one of the best ways to do that is by making the college world series. And we remember a couple years ago where the diamond heels almost did that earlier in coach Forbes tenure, where they lost uh, hosted Arkansas in the super regional and got swept. Um, and so it's just like, ah, oh, man, it's a killer. But now they've done it. And it was just such a fun team to watch. Coach Forbes talked all season long about that 27 outs mentality, meaning nine innings in a baseball game, three outs per inning means 27 outs. 
meaning we're going to fight and the game is not done until a team has gotten us out 27 times. And if that happens, so be it, you beat us. But we're going to always believe that we can win a baseball game. And that, to me, just made the experience of following this team and being with them all the more fun because you just never felt out of it. With with the lineup Carolina had, you just never knew what was going to happen, who was going to deliver the timely the timely hit or punch or whatever it was. So this team finishes 48 and 16 overall, 22 and eight in the ACC. They were the number one ACC seed, number four national seed heading into the NCAA tournament. Hosted a regional, were able to host a super, super regional, excuse me, and then move on to the College World Series. And part of what made the postseason run in particular so much fun but also stressful and took a decade off my life was all the comebacks, which started with the first game of the regional against Long Island. Carolina had a lead, but it was a precarious lead. Gave it up um, late in the game. Top of the ninth, I guess, wasn't it? And then went to the bottom of the ninth, trailing eight to five. And honestly, a lot of people gave up on this game. A lot of people left the Bosch. A lot of people turned it off or tuned it out or whatever it was. And nah, Carolina gets gets some dudes on, gets a run across, and here comes Gavin Gallagher, freshman, third baseman, walk off Grand Slam, just unreal stuff to kick off Carolina's NCAA tournament run. Wonderful, wonderful. And then, you know, you had the win over LSU, that was close the first one, then the loss to LSU where Carolina kept fighting back. And then the regional final, game seven, essentially, do or die, win or go home. Carolina's down three to two in the top of the ninth. Remember, they were the visitors in this game. Were able to scratch a run across, tie it up, hold LSU off in the bottom of the ninth, go to extra innings, one in extras to move on to the Super Regional. It was such an exciting, exciting regional where Carolina just kept doing these things. So that one was not a walk-off, but Carolina won in their last at-bat. And then you move on to the Super Regional, where in Game 1, Vance hits a walk-off bomb. An- another walk-off homer to keep Carolina going. Game 2, Carolina uh, you know, kind of holds on to the lead in the bottom of the ninth because they were the visitor to go on to the College World Series. And then you remember Game 1 of the College World Series. Another walk-off from Vance against Virginia. That one was a single to left field with two outs. Uh, for that three to two win. I mean, it's just so much fun. And unfortunately, that's where the winning ended because Carolina lost to Tennessee and then lost to FSU. Just as we kind of feared, the the pitching ended up running out, just all the injuries that kind of piled up. But I think that's another part of what made the run so impressive. You lose Jake Knapp and Folger Boaz, who were both expected uh, and, and were in Folger Boaz's case, to be weekend starters. And so when you're missing two out of those three and you're still able to put a team together, just really, really, really fun season following the Diamond Heels. If, if you're not somebody that, that dials in on the baseball team, man, I would encourage you to do so next season. And not only overcoming those pitching injuries, but I love that it came from a variety of sources. You know, it came, the, the help came from guys that had been in the program, like a Vance Honeycutt, like a Casey Cook. It came from some freshmen who were pivotal. We already talked about Gavin Gallagher, Luke Stevenson hitting a a leadoff home run in which game was that? Was it the LSU game? I don't remember. Yes, it was leading off. Um, Anyway, no, 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 no. It was the super regional game against West Virginia. He did that. Um, Jason DeCaro, you know, becoming the number one starter. All those guys are back. That's, th- you know, two everyday starters and one pitching starter. There were several transfers that were pivotal. Uh, Parks Harbor at first base, D'Onofrio, Anthony D'Onofrio in right field. Shea Sprague became the number two starter after those injuries. I mean, it's just really, really neat. And so just massive congrats to Scott Forbes and his team for cementing him as head coach in year four. And I'm expecting great things again. I know you lose Vance. I know you lose Casey Cook. Um, and we'll see if, because some of these other pitchers that were drafted can still come back. There's some big time guys coming in, some great talent transferring in. Could be another special year. You just never know with baseball. So we'll have to wait and see. Now, it might have been a great year for Hubert Davis making the Sweet 16 and Scott Forbes making the College World Series, but neither of these gentlemen matched the postseason result of a Tar Heel rookie 
head coach who is she and her team are number one on our list. We'll get to that and our honorable mentions in just a second. Right after I tell you about eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. We've made it all the way to the end of our list of the top 10 most impactful things that happened in Carolina Athletics last academic year, from 10 all the way down to number one. And ladies and gentlemen, number one, field hockey wins the national championship in Aaron Matson's first year as head coach of the Tar Heels. Oh, by the way, literally the year after she finishes playing for the Tar Heels. Just the culmination of all those things, her first year, she being so young, and winning a national championship, winning a insane national championship game, by the way, is all of what culminates to make this the number one thing. This was the 11th national championship in program history. It was the fifth in the past six years. The four before that, Aaron Matson won as a player. ACC regular season champs, seventh consecutive ACC tournament title, made all the more sweeter because they beat Duke 2-0 in the ACC tournament championship. Thank you very much. Tar Heels were 18-3 and on the season, 5-1 and in ACC play. That lone loss coming to Virginia, unfortunately, but hold on, revenge is coming there. Because in the national semifinal, like the final four of field hockey, Carolina beat Virginia two to nothing to avenge one of those three losses in the lone ACC loss. And that set up a showdown in the national championship between number one, Carolina and number two, Northwestern. This is what you want. You want the two best teams in the nation facing off against one another. So this national championship game, you get to the end of regulation, four quarters, it's tied at one. We go to overtime, nothing. I mean, there were some some attacks and, you know, some chances. Second overtime, still nothing. Still one to nothing. We go to a shootout, and it works just like it does in hockey or soccer, uh, where you get, both teams get five, you trade off, and then if you're still tied, you go to like sudden death one at a time. <laughs> Well, Northwestern hits each of their first two. Carolina hits one of their first two. Was it the first one? And then they missed the next two. And so it's like, in a shootout with just five, you're not feeling great about that with Northwestern making both of their first two and Carolina not. Because then you're chasing the math the rest of the time. But thankfully, the way things played out, Northwestern couldn't connect on any of the final three So they got two, and Carolina did connect on one of their final three. So after five penalty shots, it's still not enough. We're still tied, so now we go to sudden death. Each team has one uh, um, shootout attempt, and whatever breaks the tie, that's your national champion. I mean, it just it can't get any more intense and hype than this. So uh, Northwestern goes first. Matty Hahn successfully defends it to start sudden death, and then here comes Riley Heck steps up and nails the national champion winning shootout goal. I I, I just remember watching this whole thing and the back and forth, and it was so insane. And I I don't know about you. It is still, it is still unreal to me, but frankly, brilliant at the same time that Bubba Cunningham and the athletics department and the school trusted Aaron Matson enough to say, look, I know you just graduated, but you are going to be our next head coach. A a third coach that we've talked about today that's following a legend, Karen Shelton, whom the field that Aaron Matson coaches on is named after, oh, by the way. 
And it's like, cool, I got you. And then Coach Shelton's still around helping Aaron, and you love to see all of that kind of stuff. Ah, there we go. Man, if you've not been with us, I've been trying to curtail saying you love to see it. And so I, I just said it. I apologize. Ugh. Now it grates on me when I do it. So Aaron Matson, four national championships as a player. She played five years because of COVID. So there's that. And then wins one in her first year as head coach. I, I, that's just special. That does not happen every day. This, this is one of those stories that we will remember and talk about for a long, 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 long time. And, and honestly, I cannot wait to see what the encore is this fall for the field hockey team. So that's our top 10 most impactful things that happened in Carolina athletics this past year. I've got six quick honorable mentions that I want to mention to you. The one that just got that kind of got edged out was the whole Tez Walker saga, because if we're talking impactful things, that was clearly an impactful thing from, you know, not being eligible and then, Later on in the year, the NCAA makes all two-time transfers eligible during basketball season. It was just like, oh, here we go, right? It just the frustrating of that, Tez getting eligible, then getting hurt and not being able to play the whole rest of it. Just all of that. Um, second honorable mention, sticking with football, the emergence of both Omarion Hampton and the Butcher, Cayman Rucker, one on each side of the football. And, and these dudes, you know, you knew they were kind of special, but then it just went to a new level last year, and we get to see it again this year. So their emergence is a big thing. Another one that missed out was, you know, we talked about Vance Honeycutt and Drake May's career. Uh, we just m missing the cut of the top 10 was talking Armando Baycott's incredible career at Carolina. Um, three others, men's golf, uh, still seeking after that first national championship. I thought they were going to do it this year, but it's so hard to win the golf national championship. But that that team has it going. And then similarly, the women's tennis team kind of coming to the end of an era where they had done so much, um, it had finally won that national championship, not this year, but the year before, had to deal with a, a difficult injury this year that I think really, really hurt them. If not for that, I, I don't even want to begin to imagine what this season would have been. And then um, the final honorable mention was women's basketball. Just a tough season for them, but the reason it was impactful was because there was just so many injuries that just frankly derailed this season for Coach Banghart and the team, and so you hate to see that. But obviously an impactful thing on the Carolina athletics calendar. All right, what a fun exercise this is. I love doing it. I love reminiscing and going back through the whole year. And uh, so again, would love to interact with you and your thoughts uh, what you might have had on this list that maybe I didn't or anything like that. Thanks so much for joining me. Coming up on tomorrow's show, Coach Pat Kilby and I will be together with the next installment of our summer roster preview. It'll be a lot of fun. Please do join us for that. All right, gang, it's uh, always a great day to be a Tar Heel. If you haven't subscribed to the show on audio and video, please do so. Super simple, super easy. If you're not part of our Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, we would love to have you in there great conversation going on all the time. That's a great place to talk about this top 10 list as well. The link for that's in the show notes and it's free to join. Free. Cost you nothing at all other than just doing it and come to be with a great community of Tar Heels. Come for the Tar Heels, stay for the community. All right, I already said it, but I'll repeat it again. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be back tomorrow, but until then, peace. Peace.